Hello, Trinity Tigers. Welcome to Learning Together, the live webinar series that's a part of our lifelong learning initiatives from the Trinity University Office of Alumni Relations. I am Mike Bacon, class of 1989, and I am honored to serve as the Vice President for Alumni Relations and Development. This webinar is a part of our series called Learning Together. This is actually our 15th webinar since 2016. You can expect to see a few more between now and March and more to come after that, but we're so happy you're tuning in. We have folks from all over the country, uh, states including Utah, New York, Wisconsin, and of course Texas, and we have folks who are probably watching from Mexico and Canada, so clearly on a path to world domination with our webinar series. We're excited. <laughs> It's my pleasure to introduce today's webinar speaker, my friend and classmate, Mike McBride, also from the class of 1989. Mike chairs Crow and Dunleavy's Indian Law and Gaming practice group out of the Tulsa office, which is also my hometown. He is the vice president and president-elect of the International Masters of Gaming Law and has served that organization for 13 years. Mike is in his fourth term as the attorney general for the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. He serves a number of other tribes and companies involving federal Indian law. He is the former general counsel for the Osage Nation. He was a justice of the Supreme Courts of the Pawnee and the Kaw Nations. Mike has practiced for a quarter century and has represented scores of tribal governments and companies. He has tried over 50 cases to conclusion in federal, state, and tribal courts. He's a third generation Oklahoman growing up and around the Osage Nation, including Bartlesville and Fairfax County, or sorry, Fairfax, Oklahoma, where many of the murders within the Osage Nation occurred. Today's webinar will include Mike McBride's take on David Grant's bestseller, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. Uh, please know that you'll be able to submit your questions as you listen to Mike McBride, and he's going to answer them as part of our conversation. Some of you may also be tuning in on Facebook Live, watching us either at the Trinity University Alumni Association page or the Trinity University Facebook page. If you have questions there, we're keeping track of it, and we can add them to the list. So I am pleased to introduce to you Mike McBride, my classmate, my friend, and before I start, I just want to say thank you, Mike, for the Alpha Psi parties that you had when I was a student <laughs> at Trinity. So, Mike, uh, I'll turn it over to you. We've got some questions. Um, I really enjoyed the book. It, you told me it would be a page turner, and quite frankly, it was. Um, but let's start off with some general questions about you and kind of your expertise in this area. So what drew you to practice Indian law? Was it, was it a specific goal you had in mind, or did you get drawn into it through circumstances? Well, Mike, uh, first I would say that I'm a Scotch, Irish, English, French, white guy, but I have done one of those DNA tests that re reveals a, a tiny smidgen of Native American ancestry. So it wasn't overt uh, you know, family um, being involved in uh, Indian law, um, but I was on my own from early age, and I, I went to uh, boarding school, and uh, one of the influences was a fellow by the name of Maynard Natumia, who was a Hopi Indian, and he was a state champion runner in Arizona, and he taught me how to run cross country. And uh, Gary So and some others that I, I went to high school with. And I was greatly influenced by growing up in and around the Osage Reservation with a lot of Osages, Cherokees, Lenape, Delawares up in Bartlesville area. And I had a lot of great admiration for Indian art and culture. Of course, at Trinity, I, I double majored in philosophy and political science. And what do you do with a degree like that? <laughs> Anything you want. Well, <laughs> yeah. it, it was a great preparation for law school. And, and I was focused on law at, at Trinity. I, I was president of the uh, pre-law association. And I also served as a justice on the Trinity uh, Supreme Court, the student court. And um, I uh, did take a year off um, between undergrad and, and law school to make money to pay for law school. <laughs> and um, I went back to Arizona, and I, I, I was the Arizona representative for a, a college textbook publisher. And so I had 37 colleges and universities that I traveled to. And I went through a lot of Indian country, um, put about 30,000 miles on the car that year. 
and uh, a lot of it was uh, you know different Indian reservations. Um, but I didn't know I was going to practice Indian law at that time. It was really when I got to law school. I, I clerked for a justice on the Oklahoma Supreme Court, Justice Yvonne Cogger, and I, I clerked for a, a judge on the Court of Indian Appeals, the, the chief magistrate judge for that, Arvo Mikkonen, and uh, had a lot of exposure then. And I also served as an editor of the American Indian Law Review. And I made the decision during law school that I really was fascinated by federal Indian law, and that's where I wanted to practice. Coming out in 1993, um, tribes were uh, still in large part pretty rural and, uh, and fairly poverty stricken. And a lot of the practice of, of Indian law at that time was poverty law, quite frankly. And one of the, the few and best opportunities that I had coming out of law school was to practice in Indian legal services. And I represented the impoverished tribal citizens and Indian tribes and Nevada citizens as my first job. And I came back to Oklahoma and I, I opened my own law practice and focused on federal Indian law and I've, I've been practicing ever since. Well, thanks for that recap. I, I knew some of that, but it's, it's great to hear how you've been led to this path. I'm wondering, how did you first hear about this dark history with the Osage Nation? Was it through your course of study or through your work? Through my family. Okay. My, uh, my mother and my aunt were born in Fairfax, the epicenter of this reign of terror. Um, my grandparents uh, originally came from uh, Geronimo, Oklahoma, which is south uh, and west, um, south of Lawton. And they, they moved and settled in Fairfax uh, probably uh, in the late 1920s, early 1930s. And my grandfather had a five and dime store actually across the street from uh, uh, the Mathis store, the, the, the trading company, the Mathis trading company. And uh, I uh, heard a lot of stories growing up from my, my mom and, and aunt about uh, the horrible things that happened there. And a lot of it was whispered and it was dark and I didn't know a lot of the details. My, my first uh, scholarship uh, was uh, a book by Dennis McAuliffe called uh, The Deaths of Sybil Bolton, which was written in 1994. And Dennis McAuliffe was an editor for the Washington Post, and uh, his grandmother was, uh, he learned his grandmother had died under mysterious circumstances, and he investigated it and wrote a book about it, and he found out that, that she was murdered. I think this is referenced in the book, am I right? It is. Um, David Grand references uh, the deaths of Sybil Bolton. It was renamed uh, and re-released later under the name Bloodlands. And uh, you know, that book really opened my eyes uh, with a little bit more detail. But I can tell you, uh, after that, I represented the Osage Nation. Um, and uh, I heard a lot of stories from the leaders and from my clients. And I can tell you that it's a very dark and hurtful experience. And most o Osages don't like to talk about the reign of terror. There were so many unsolved murders that are not even referenced in um, Killers of the Flower Moon, and, and many that, that will probably always go unsolved because of the passage of history. You know, Mike, we've done a poll to find out how many of our viewers are watch, have read the book, and so it was about 60% have not read the book, and about 40% have read the book. And so I, I hope that folks will actually go out and read it after our conversation today, but it might be helpful for you to explain kind of the title um, how, how did it be? Why, why is it called the Killer Moon? No, Killer of, of the Flower Moon is the name of a, of a poem by an Osage tribal citizen. Uh, and, and that's the, the title of the poem. And it, it's in the book towards the end in the Third Chronicle. And uh, it, it talks about uh, flowers uh, that, that come up uh, towards the... Um, the, the summer solstice in, in May, in, in that time period, out on the Osage Prairie. And um, she, she wrote about the Washashi, the, the Osage people, and, and that's where the title of the book comes from.
You know, you mentioned the author David Gran. Talk a little bit about him, and I think you've had a chance to correspond with him. Yeah, um, David is a fantastic writer, a great author. He's an excellent researcher. Uh, he's an award-winning author. Um, he's a staff writer uh, at The New Yorker, uh, The New York Times. Um, he received the best book of 2009 by multiple news outlets, and including um, uh, a, a number of news outlets for his uh, first book, The uh, Lost City of Z, A Tale of Deadly Obsession in the Amazon. It was number one on the New York Times bestseller list in 2009, and it was adapted into a major motion picture. He also wrote The Devil and Sherlock Holmes. Um, he was named by Men's Journal as one of the best true crime uh, stories ever written, and uh, he has been selected as the best American crime writing, uh, best American sports writing, and best American non-required reading uh, author. <laughs> He's written for the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, uh, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, and New Republic. And uh, in preparing for these lectures, I first gave a, a public lecture at, at the city of Tulsa County uh, Library um, back in October, and I corresponded with uh, David um, in preparation for that uh, that book lecture. And um, I reached out to him, and he, he said um, that he he hoped the presentation goes well. And, and and this is what he wrote to me: He said, "I think a few of the important messages are that this was not about a singular evil figure, and he's referring to William K. Hale." but rather about a culture of killing, which was much more widespread than the Bureau ever exposed, and that there were many white citizens who were complicit in many cases that went unresolved. I think the way the guardianship system works is important and emblematic of the combination of prejudice and greed that underlies so many of these crimes. And I think it's important to understand that these crimes took place not that long ago, and that we can't understand the formation of this country or the present without understanding and reckoning with the past. You know, Mike, I think it would be helpful to have a, a synopsis about the plot of the book, given that a large number of our, our viewers haven't read it. I recall you shared with me that Oklahoma statehood was in 1907, and so really this started only about 13 years later in what was largely still kind of the Wild West. And so um, I, I, what I found so fascinating about the book, aside from being horrified by what was happening to the tribe, but just the level of corruption in the, in the police force and, and sort of the complicit nature of everybody around the, the tribe um, seeing it as a way to make money. So maybe you can kind of give us some context about the book. Well, first, I'll, I'll tell you the way that David Graham structured the book, and it was a, an unusual way that um, he hasn't done with any of his, his other books. And it's a little bit unusual in and of itself. It's three chronicles. The first chronicle is um, written from the perspective of uh, Molly Burkhart, who was uh, murdered and had a, a number of her family members murdered. The, the second chronicle is about uh, Tom White, and Tom White is the um, young, well, he wasn't young, but um, he was a lawman from Texas, a, a traditional cowboy uh, lawman, uh, who was recruited by J. Edgar Hoover to come into the FBI and, and help work this, uh, this horrible uh, reign of terror that, that was occurring in, in Oklahoma. And uh, the, the third chronicle is written from David Grant's perspective as the author. And his diligent research through the historic archives, through befriending members of the Osage Nation, and talking to them about their families in the past. And uh, a lot of the uh, unsolved uh, murders, and, and he even connects the dots uh, potentially on, on some uh, of the uh, potential murders. You know, I, I, I could add a little bit more uh, context as well. Uh, you mentioned Oklahoma uh, being formed in 1907. Well, Oklahoma used to be Indian territory, and basically o Oklahoma was a dumping ground 
for tribes that were forced from their homelands, primarily uh, the southeastern United States, but also from other parts of the country. And at one time, Indian territory had over a, a hundred Indian tribes, and many were forced here on the Trail of Tears uh, in the 1830s as a part of the removal time period. That was when the United States was strengthening, and uh, there were a lot of treaties, and, and uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, the president, came into office and instituted a policy of removal, forcing tribes to be relocated to Oklahoma um, at, at that time. And it was a, a horrible, tragic time period in which a lot of tribes came here and, and lost a lot of their population through disease and, and the travel and relocation and, and weather and so forth. And uh, eventually the, uh, the treaty time period came, came to an end shortly after the Civil War in 1872. And uh, at that time, uh, the relations with the, the Indians were housed within the War Department. And eventually that changed to the Department of Interior. In the late 1800s, uh, the United States uh, took a, a new policy, and that was assimilation and allotment. And that began in the, the early uh, 1890s. And the plan was that they were going to break up the tribal land mass, allot individual parcels of land to native citizens, and make those uh, uh, plots of land alienable to, uh, so they could be bought or sold. And uh, that uh, there would be surplus lands that would be open to uh, uh, settlement um, by the whites that were continuing to encroach. The Osage were no stranger to this, and, and they uh, had a homeland in, uh, in Kansas, in southeastern Kansas, uh, about four million acres, I believe. And uh, the United States uh, bought them out for about 70 cents an acre. And uh, they relocated to Oklahoma, uh, the rocky, scrubby area that later became uh, an, an Indian territory that later became uh, what is now Osage County. And uh, they ended up purchasing that from the, the Cherokee Nation. And, um, but they, uh, they had a, a very wise and learned uh, leader, uh, the, the chief of the Osage at that time. And they had some good lawyers, and they were holdouts on the allotment process. A number of tribes were forced into allotment, and the Osage really held out. But they had an advantage because they, they owned their, their reservation in fee. That is, uh, it wasn't a reservation uh, held in, by the United States in trust for them, but rather it was uh, fee land that they owned on their own. Because so, they bought it from the Cherokees. That's right. And although... They got much less for their Kansas reservation than um, what it was worth from the historic records that I saw. Uh, they, they still had money that they could go you know, buy land. So they held out until 1906. The, the Seminoles, the Choctaws, the Cherokees, uh, the Muscogee Creek, and uh, others um, reached agreements earlier than that, and they were basically the last holdouts. And one unusual provision that they had in, in their um, – uh, allotment agreement was that they were going to retain mineral rights. There was some inkling that um, that there might be oil in the Osage Reservation, but in 1906, um, oil was not such a, a valuable commodity, and, and it wasn't in, in great commercial production. There was some production in uh, Pennsylvania, but it, it, it wasn't as significant yet. So the Osage uh, held out, and uh, in 1906, there was a, a federal um, congressional act, the Osage Allotment Act of 1906, and it established this uh, mineral reservation and allotted the, the Osage land. And there were 200 and, I'm sorry, 2,226 original Lattes of the Osage Nation. Um, move forward uh, pretty quickly thereafter. The Model T was uh, invented by uh, Mr. Ford. Uh, the, pro the production ramped up pretty quickly. Then you had the Great War in uh, uh, 1917 through about 1920, um, which is otherwise known as World War I. And uh, what did they use in World War I? Tanks, ships, early airplanes. Oil became strategic and extremely important to industrial society and to the war machine. And at the time, uh, with this mineral reservation, 
uh, there became interest in companies leasing and uh, paying royalties to uh, develop the oil. Um, back in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, there were some reports of a shiny black substance that would appear on creek beds and, and the Osage reservation lands. And uh, it was similar to uh, oil that they used on uh, uh, oiling uh, axles for um, uh, stagecoaches and so forth. So um, there started to be a little bit of development. And, and first it was um, dollars and then $10 and then hundreds of dollars. And uh, by, uh, I believe, 1921, there were about 8,000 wells on the Osage. And by 1923, at the height of the Reign of Terror, uh, each headright owner um, would receive uh, about $12,000 uh, per quarter. And annually, that was the equivalent of about $180,000 in, in today's dollars per head right. Um, if you can imagine, uh, you know, that, that kind of distribution, you know, for the oil wealth that the Osage uh, enjoyed, they, they became the wealthiest people per capita um, at that time period in, in the world as a result of this mineral re reservation and, and the, the mineral wealth. You know, Mike, one of the things David Grand does such a good job of is he explains that this massive wealth that came to the tribe, um, there was a lot of crazy spending, but then sort of the, the whole system of guardianship that sprung up, the, the theory that the Indians weren't competent to manage their own money, that right. truly was at the core of, of some of the criminal acts that came to be, that happened during the Reign of Terror. Maybe you could explain how that guardianship worked. Well, one of the crazy things about the Osage is, you know, the Indian people um, were forced to basically become farmers through, the, through this allotment process. They just tried to disband the governments. And uh, for the most part, Indians uh, across the country were extremely impoverished and uh, probably the lowest socioeconomic class of, of people in, in the United States. But that was not the case with the Osage. With this oil wealth, uh, they suddenly became um, profligate and, uh, and very wealthy. Um, I, I heard stories from some Osage citizens uh, that the largest Pierce Arrow automobile dealership was in Pahasco, Oklahoma, in the heart of the Osage nation in, in the 1920s. Um, there were stories about uh, Osages having, uh, you know, white servants, mansions, sending their kids off to boarding schools and, and to Europe and taking trips and, and so forth. And uh, where one family in America, white families, uh, would be lucky to have one car, many Osage families. All right, really? Mike. We're I think we get we're getting you back here. The press was really sensationalized at that time period, and uh, they wrote about the Osages, and there were tremendous articles uh, across the country chronicling uh, the incredible wealth of the Osage. Well, the United States Congress uh, took notice of this and started to institute some some laws because they were concerned that the Osages couldn't handle hand, handle their wealth. So they passed some laws that required a guardianship. Um, that is that if you had a certain blood quantum, or I, I believe it was half, half blood or more, you were considered incompetent and that a, a lawyer or a local businessman had to look after your affairs. So even if you were a, a great chief, like the, the chief of those ages at, at the time of the Osage Allotment Act that spoke seven languages and, um, and college educated and so forth, you, you still had to be subjected to this legal system in which um, the others looked after for you. This created a, an environment uh, for a lot of greed and corruption. And there were a lot of non-Indian whites uh, that took advantage of, of Osages and embezzled money um, from these accounts and uh, did kickbacks with businesses. and. Uh, it, it was a really horrible time system under these special laws 
that were based on race uh, that applied only to the Osage. And I think that's one of the, the things that helped set up the uh, environment in which folks would commit and get away with murder. One other thing, Mike, that you said was, you know, the early government of Oklahoma, it was only about, you know, 13 years old in 1920, and Osage County was a pretty rural place. Um, the, um, the law enforcement there was, um, was spotty and not well-funded, not well-trained. When, uh, when crimes happened, oftentimes it was an ad hoc investigation in which they would call together uh, local ranchers and uh, local constables and, and go out and try to investigate. And, and some of that's detailed in the book. So it was very uh, haphazard and, and uh, imprecise and not standardized. And, um, you know, there was a lot of um, a lot of corruption at that time in, in the local government. You know, Mike, one of the things I think David Grand does such a great job of is he explains that that kind of massive corruption meant that the, the Osage couldn't get justice, that there were lots of... Um, promises made to them to investigate and to check things out, but through the kind of the intricate system of patrimony between the guardians and the police force, the, the sheriff in town, that none of that was happening. And so it, it created this environment where uh, it, it took a lot to get the government's attention. Maybe, yeah, I'm, I'm cautious because so many people haven't read this book, I don't want to give out too many specific details, but there was definitely a process of re the Osage realizing they weren't getting justice, but it took a couple years for them to realize that they needed to seek help on a broader scale. So maybe talk a little bit about what they had to do to get uh, attention, uh, to get some justice. Absolutely. Well, you know, a lot of... Uh, Osages hired private investigators, and uh, they talk about in the book uh, the, the rise of private eyes, and uh, you know all these investigators would come in and, and, and try to help, but private investigators weren't regulated, and there was a pretty porous boundary between good men and bad men at, at that time, and uh, some private eyes were actually uh, hired or bought off by um, bad people, and so. It, it appears that there is a lot of corruption even within uh, private eyes. But the state attorney general was contacted for Oklahoma, and he pleaded for help to uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, asked for help there. Uh, the investigations were bungled. There was a, I read about this 300 pound uh, sheriff out of Bahuska that apparently was uh, alleged to have been in cahoots with uh, some of the wealthy landowners that were corrupt. And uh, never mounted a, a decent investigation. The Osage uh, were desperate and they uh, reached out to a, a trusted uh, rancher oil man uh, by the name of Barney McBride, who uh, is perhaps my namesake. I'm, my wife did some genealogy to see if he was related to my family. There's some dead ends uh, on the McBride side at that time. So I'm not fully sure if Barney was one of my relatives or not, but. The Osage Travel Council sent Barney McBride to Washington, D.C. in about 1921 to, to plead for help. And um, he went and he got, a, uh, got to Washington, D.C. and received a telegram. And uh, he was warned um, to be careful um, that they believed that he was followed and being watched. And he had two things with him, a, a Bible and a large caliber handgun. Well, he had a meeting set up with the federal um, agents and, and federal representatives of the Department of Interior and other places uh, the next morning, and he didn't show up for his meetings. Shortly thereafter, um, the police found his body uh, naked in a ravine with a, a burlap bag over his head. He'd been stabbed 20 times, and uh, there was a name card put next to him that identified who he was. And uh, he had been murdered. And at the time, the Washington newspaper said it was the most heinous and atrocious uh, murder in the, the history of Washington, D.C. That's one example of uh, you know some of the things that were going on. Another example is uh, there was a lawyer, um, a white lawyer by the name of W.W. W. Vaughn. And uh, he was reputed to have... Uh, some evidence that he, he shared with others that 
he said that he um, had some evidence on one of the um, the major ringleaders in Osage County, and that he was going to turn that evidence. And um, he ended up dying, uh, being thrown from a train, and they they found his his body. And uh, one interesting story about that is. Uh, just uh, two months ago, I, I gave a book lecture about Killers of the Flower Moon at the University of Central Oklahoma. And in the audience uh, was uh, uh, Mr. Bond's grandson, hmm. who is now a professor at the University of Central Oklahoma. And uh, his murder was unsolved. But in the book, Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, David Grand does some additional research and uh, connects some dots. Uh, a potential probable killer of uh, Mr. Vaughn, the attorney. What a relief that must have been to the family. Well, um, it, it was a relief to uh, Professor Vaughn's sister, and she died shortly thereafter. Um, it, it was a relief to know, but you know, I can tell you that a lot of Osage citizens that I talk to uh, still don't like to talk about this, and, and they warned me. Um, you know, about speaking publicly about this book, that they wanted me to be careful. And I should say that the views I'm, I'm giving you are, are my views only. And having read the book, and, you know, as a tribal attorney and not those of the Osage Nation. So I didn't want to talk about a lot of the individual families, um, you know, that lost right. um, loved ones. You know, you were on the track to take us to the what really became the formation of the FBI. Can you talk a little bit about how this reign of terror led to some credibility for the FBI? Absolutely. The FBI was a young uh, organization at that time that had just been created maybe 10 or 15 years earlier. Um, I believe it was housed out of the Justice Department. Um, and they investigated a lot of financial um, matters. Their agents uh, uh, had no arrest powers. They didn't carry guns. Um, it, there were only a handful of offices around the country. And uh, at the time when the state attorney general finally prevailed upon the commissioner of Indian Affairs to launch an investigation and um, convince them that there was a conspiracy going on and that there were scores of murders that were unsolved, then uh, it wound up on the desk of a young uh, deputy uh, commissioner of the what was known then as the Bureau of Investigation by the by the name of J. Edgar Hoover. He was 29 years old at the time, and uh, he uh, he called in Tom White, as I mentioned before, who was a, a Texas traditional cowboy lawman to uh, to help with the investigation, and uh, he um, encouraged him to to start a team because the previous investigations were in shambles. They, they had no arrests. The murders were continuing, and something had to be done. So Tom White went out and uh, recruited a, a Native American, uh, the only Native American FBI agent or Bureau of Investigation agent, and some others, and he encouraged them to go undercover. Um, despite the policy that FBI agents weren't supposed to carry guns, uh, a lot of them did anyway because it was so dangerous out there. They were getting double-crossed, and... Uh, uh, given uh, phony information. And uh, shortly before Tom White got involved in the investigation, um, there was a, a messed up investigation done where they had a, a convict from the state of Oklahoma pen penitentiary get sprung and go out and they were going to try to embed him to cozy up to some of the, uh, the, the corrupt people in Osage County that were committing these murders and turn evidence. Well, his name was Blackie. And Blackie uh, disappeared and went on the lam and ended up uh, robbing a bank and killing a lawman when he was supposed to be assisting investigators at the investigation. So it was a huge scandal. And at that time... It was a black eye. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Blackie got sent back to the penitentiary and, and later died in a hail of bullets trying to escape. Um, but J. Edgar Hoover had a, a real mess on his hands. And, and so... He was desperate to try to get things turned around, and ultimately there were scores of FBI agents. I, well, actually, I think there were about thirteen that worked on the case. And I, I really enjoyed how he explains them going on. The author explains how they'd go undercover 
and trying to infiltrate and befriend the, the ranchers and the guardians in that community. I thought he did a nice job explaining that. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think one thing that David Grant really points out is that um, once they charged uh, four key people, including the ringleader, William K. Hale, uh, and some of his henchmen that he hired, um, the investigation stopped and the prosecution stopped. But the official number for the Osage Reign of Terror, the number of murders between 1921 and 24 was about 24 murders. But based upon David Grant's research and interviews with Osage citizens, the numbers could easily have gone uh, into the hundreds. And there are there's evidence of murders happening as early as 1917, 1918, and even running into the early years of the Depression, 1931, 1932. So it wasn't just uh, William K. Hale and, and his henchmen involved in this. And, that, and that's one thing that David Grant really wanted to emphasize with this book. As you read the book, you realize that so many of the Indians they would pass away mysteriously. And so oftentimes it was called tuberculosis. Uh, he explains in a couple instances how Indians who never drunk before were uh, claimed to have died of alcohol poisoning. And uh, so it was pretty clear in retrospect that they're murder they're, they'd been murdered and it had been staged. So one of our, one of our listeners asked the question, um, when Osage members are trying to figure out, the, those of Osage descent, can they do research to try and figure out what happened to their relatives? Absolutely. Um, you know, a number of Osage families have done extensive research. And David Grant talks about following a, finding an unpublished manuscript at one of the libraries, you know, that was basically uh, typewritten on a computer and uh, printed out, you know, from 1998. And that, that was one, you know, quest to find out what happened to my family. Dennis McAuliffe's book, uh, The Deaths of Sybil Bolton, uh, later titled Bloodlands, is another example. Uh, Chief District Judge Marvin Stepson of the Osage Nation District Court, his grandfather uh, was a famous uh, 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 cowboy um, rodeo star that was killed during the Reign of Terror. And he did a lot of research on his own to try to figure out what happened. You know, but a lot of those have come to dead ends because of just the, the amount of time that's gone by. You mentioned some of the, the murders and the methods. Uh, you know, I heard stories about a house being blown up not far from my, my grandparents' home in, in Fairfax with dynamite. Uh, there were strychnine poisonings, uh, people shot in the back of the head. My mom told me the story of a, a rancher, a very accomplished horseman who allegedly was thrown from his horse and uh, died in six inches of water. That was very suspicious. There were lots of uh, suspicious uh, stories and circumstances that I heard. When you, when you read this book, you really get a sense of how terrified the Osage must have been. The, one of the kind of the first chronicle about Molly Burkhart, she, I mean, she gets to the point where she, all of her relatives, her sisters have all died mysteriously. She's facing some strange uh, case of diabetes that she can't beat, and she's afraid to leave the house. So I thought the author did a, a really masterful job of creating that, why it's called a reign of terror. That's truly how those people felt. Yeah, there's reference in the book about Freddy lights. Um, this was back in a time when some of the homes in the Osage were just getting elect electricity. And uh, the wealthy Osage headright owners would uh, light up their houses at night with what they called Freddy lights. And um, I, I heard stories from some Osage elders in preparation for, for my book lectures uh, about uh, families that, that had uh, kids and that did very well in high school. Like one, um, one family told me about their, their daughter that was valedictorian at, at the Hominy High School, and they, they wanted to send her off to uh, Oklahoma State University to study, but they were too afraid because they thought that she would uh, um, end up getting targeted and, and pass away. They were afraid to um, eat at restaurants. Um, they, they took a lot of measures of just because of the, the mistrust, and there's still a lot of mistrust to this day. Mm. 
One of the things that you see in this novel, the story, is um, it, Osage members marrying white men, and that actually becomes part of the problem in the long run. Was intermarriage common? Was that fairly rare at the time, or did it start increasing over time? As uh, one, one of the characters talks about, and Cordy's asked, um, what, what do you do for a living? And he said, I don't have to work. I'm married to an Osage. So I, I just wondered uh, about that intermarriage and how common it was. It, it became more common. Uh, you know, the, the assimilation policies were pretty successful, and, um, and there were a lot of bad people that targeted the Osages for, um, you know, for want of a better term, fake love, you know, to try to uh, get in with the, the family and, and inherit uh, the Osage rights, the, the head rights, because they could be um, transferred uh, to the estate to members of the family. And it wasn't just men, Mike. Uh, there were uh -huh. women marrying uh, Osage sense, men as well. And uh, you know, there, are, there are stories in the book about you know, mistrust of uh, women marrying in as well. I'm, I'm recalling at one point did the Osage Nation make it so the head rights could only be conveyed to somebody who had a certain percentage of Osage uh, blood? That, uh, that was one of the reforms after the Reign of Terror that Congress instituted to amend the, uh, the Osage Allotment Act to um, keep the head rights within the Osage. They, they could still be um, uh, non-Indians that had inherited could still receive benefits, but they couldn't be transferred to non-Indians uh, thereafter. I believe that's how it went. I want to keep. And there, there were there were Go other ahead. reforms as well. I wanted to keep encouraging questions, Mike. I cut you off. Talk a little bit more about sort of what happened after the Reign of Terror and some of the consequences, whether it be they be legal or otherwise. Well, one thing uh, I would point out is uh, you know that the. Uh, Mineral estate and the head rights have, have provided uh, great wealth to the Osage, and many have, have saved and and been good stewards and, and built, uh, you know, great uh, family businesses and institutions. And uh, it's it's been it's been very good for the Osage government. Um, the United States had a trust responsibility to manage that mineral estate, though, and a lot of it was mismanaged. And in the year two thousand. The Osage sued uh, over that mismanagement. And the federal uh, class lawsuit was settled in 2011, and the United States paid the Osage Nation $280 million, and it was the largest uh, settlement of, a, of its kind in the history of the United States for a mineral claim like that. Mike, one of our viewers asked the question, um, in your opinion, did the Osage Nation's system of head rights contribute to this situation? Or, to ask it another way, the Osage Nation and their ownership of minerals, is it structured similar to how other Native tribes were? Would this have still happened if it were structured in a different way? This was a highly unusual situation, and the Osage are the only ones that I know of that have a mineral estate. and. Their negotiation of the term and the allotment agreement to retain those mineral interests, and it wasn't just oil; it could be any sort of mineral, uh, coal, rocks, whatever that would be harvest, harvested from the ground. Um, they retained that that mineral estate, so it was an unusual situation. It, it led to great wealth, but but it also led to you know, great corruption, and, and then being targeted. Uh, I think. Uh, other tribes around the country have, had also been targeted because uh, the allotment process of breaking up the tribal reservation and forcing Indian tribal citizens to become individual property owners from a communal system um, led to a lot of uh, potential graft and corruption of people um, taking those lands. and. Uh, the allotment process, that the allotment policy was one of the most sinister um, and disruptive um, policies in, in the history of the United States in terms of dispossessing tribes of their land. Within 20 or 30 years, uh, 180 million acres uh, went out of um, tribal, tribal hands and into the hands of non-Indians during that time period. And it wasn't until the Indian Reorganization Act in 
1934 and the o- Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act in 1936, that there was sort of a, a, a restructuring and focusing on helping rebuild tribal governments that have been decimated after the allotment policy. As you read this book, it, it's so clear that the mineral rights and the money attached were both a blessing and a curse to the tribe. I'm, uh, I'm curious, in your conversations with members of the tribe today, h- how do they see it? And we have a viewer who also adds to that question um, the, that the Osage may not see this in the same light as the author. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. You know, I think David Grant did a, an excellent job of representing uh, the individual um, concerns of Osage citizens of, you know, this horrible reign of terror and the, the evil side of this great wealth and, and the corruption that it, it attracted. Um, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of Osage citizens are, are very grateful and thankful to have this, uh, this head right, you know, but not all Osages have, have head rights. Um, and it, it's, it's been an issue of uh, a political issue within the, the nation of, you know, basically the haves and the have nots. Under the old Osage system of government, the 1906 Act, uh, only those people that had head rights um, had, a, had a vote and had a say in the, the government of those days. There have been constitutional reforms, and there was a, a new constitution brought, up, brought about in 2006, in recent history, where non Osages, I'm sorry, Osages of um, non head right holders um, could be citizens and, and, and vote you know, with, under that new constitution. And under the headright system, there were actually non-Indians uh, early on that were headright holders, and they had the right to vote, but they were non-Indian. So it was a real unusual and complex yeah. history with the Osage. So, and from what I gather, different from how other Indian nations resolved ownership and designation in their tribe. That's right. The Osages have a number of federal laws dating back to 1906, and often oftentimes amended uh, every decade or so since um, that deal specifically with the Osage. So they, the Osage have a lot of special laws that apply just to them. It's a very complex situation. My mother's family is Cherokee, and she grew up in Oklahoma in the Vinita area. And she said, as growing up, they always referred to the Osage as, as, the, as rich. So uh, there was clearly, among other tribes, a sense that the Osage had access to funds that they didn't. Um, one of our, right. our viewers asked the question about um, current litigation and the installation of windmill farms on Osage territory. Do you know anything about that? I, I know a little bit of, about it. Um, there was a decision from the U.S. Court of Appeals from the Tenth Circuit um, involving an entity called Osage Wind. Um, and basically the Tenth Circuit said that um, large disturbances of soil uh, out on the Osage in building these wind towers constituted mining under the, the federal laws and the regulations. And therefore, to do that, you have to go through the Osage Nation to get a permit through their Minerals Council. Okay. That's basically the long and short of it. You know, as you read this book, it, it, it almost feels like it's written to be a movie. Any, any knowledge of whether there's a movie planned for this? Absolutely. There was a pretty uh, fervent and spirited uh, uh, auction for rights to uh, the movie of Killers of the Flower Men. And as I understand it, uh, Leonard DiCaprio and uh, Martin Scorsese teamed up with the group and purchased rights to uh, make a movie for $5 million. And I've, I've heard stories that they've been scouting uh, in the area uh, during the fall. So we may see uh, uh, another movie soon. And, and certainly uh, Leonard DiCaprio did a, a great job in, in Revenant and uh, I think has a special interest in Native American affairs. I, I just hope, though, that um, given the sensitivity of the Osage people to this reign of terror and the mistrust and hurt that they still feel even generations later, that there's a sympathy and um, an empathy uh, to produce that movie in a good way that's not hurtful to them.
You know, Mike, you talk about the tribal tribal history, and so many people today have forgotten about any of this. It was huge news in the time at which it was happening, but generationally, it was something I never learned in school, and I lived in Oklahoma, took Oklahoma history, never heard about any of this. And so I wonder, how does the tribe keep this memory alive? How does that generation three removed, two removed, know about this history? Is it oral stories from their families, or is, is there a more structured way they pass on what happened? Well, you know, the, the big social cultural event for the Osage is the, the Lakshah, which, which happens uh, in June. There's three dances in the Pahaska district, the Gray Horse district, and the Hominy district. And they, they spend three or four days together. A lot of families come together, and they, they have a lot of traditional dances. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, time together with families passing that along. It's chronicled in the Osage Nation Museum. And there are, are some books out there that I've, I've mentioned. Um, the, uh, a, a Pipe for February uh, that Raymond Redcorn, uh, I believe it was Raymond Redcorn, wrote. He just passed away this past summer. Um, it was written um, probably about 15 or so years ago. Is another um, source. He writes about the reign of terror in that book. It's fictionalized, but a lot of it is based on fact. So there's still a lot of talk, but you know, as I said before, it's uncomfortable, and those sages don't like to talk about it publicly, and it's very sensitive. So, um, you know, I, I, I applaud uh, David Grand for his handling of it, and obviously he um, achieved a, a great amount of trust and respect mm -hmm. to be able to write a book like that. How many members of the Osage tribe are alive today? I just looked that up, and uh, I believe that there are... Um, about 6,700, I believe, or no, that, that's the number that's in Oklahoma. Um, about 6,700 live within Oklahoma, um, and I think about 13,000 nationally, and there's a big contingency of Osages that live in uh, Southern California. A question from one of our viewers. In your legal capacity, do you believe that the governmental systems today are relatively free from corruption and dealing fairly with Native Americans? Maybe a loaded legal, question. <laughs> well, things are very political in Washington, and things are very political at, at tribes. Um, I don't sense that there's a, a great deal of corruption, but there there are lots of politics, and uh, you know, just just as we've seen recently with with the Dreamers uh, and immigrants and so forth, uh, you know, that it just depends on who's in power, and. Uh, the policies for Indian tribes over time have been like a swinging pendulum. You know, we, we had the treaty era back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, when the United States was a, a young, um, not so powerful government. We, we had uh, the termination period. We had the, the war years in the mid 1800s, the late 1800s. We had assimilation and the allotment time period. And then we had Indian reorganization. All right, we're hoping you come back to us, Mike. <laughs> and had a time in the 1950s called termination, in which uh, the uh, uh, tribes were struck out by Congress. But today, the, the policy of the United States is self-determination, and that's been a place since the Nixon administration. And the Indian Self-Determination Reorganization, Indian Self-Determination Act of 1972, and that's still the prevalent policy today. And with Indian Gaming, uh, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act actually turns 30 years this year, three decades. Uh, there's been a quite a bit of economic development and, and wealth created by tribal governments. Um, and tribal governments are much more vibrant than, than they have ever been today. One of our viewers writes that um, he is 164th Osage. And in the process of trying to find out more about the family history and the their dates, um, found out that his grandfather was George Marlin. Uh, one of the E.W. Marlin was an oil man referenced in the book. So that's interesting to see the connections. Mike, as we close up our time together, as you think about this book and recommend it to others, any, any big lessons that you're taking away from this book? <laughs> 
Well, again, as David Graham uh, emphasizes, just the the number of unsolved murders and, and details that have been lost to history. And, you know, as I drive around the Osage and where my, my grandparents uh, lived, and my parents even still have a, a small ranch in Osage County, uh, you know, I'm struck by the feeling of, you know, what happened out here and um, will any of this ever be uh, solved further you hear people talking about you know you better finish the book because there's a twist at the end this is this story truly you, you want to read it to the end as i was reading it in preparation for our time together mike I, I found myself sneaking into parts of the house where my kids weren't just so i could keep reading um, but the ending was especially dramatic after he tells those stories he really talks about connecting the dots as you've called it uh, mike is there anything else you want to share with us about um about the book? Just a, a perspective from my mother. Uh, my mother got the book uh, on an afternoon and she stayed up all night reading it. it. It's a real page turner. It really is a very, very well written. And there's a reason that it was the Amazon book of the year in 2017. Is there a Mike, is there um, any, have any major news organizations covered this story since the book? Are you aware of that? I believe that um, CBS um, has done a, a profile of David Grant in the book, and um, there, there have been some articles out there. One of our, I'm not real familiar with them. One of our viewers, Constance, uh, asks, and maybe we can pan back to you for this question, asks about the artwork in your office behind you. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Well, this just some knickknacks. Uh, I, I have some some pots and different things, uh, most of which have been gifts to me. Um, I do have a. I love Indian art and culture. I, I wish I could show you my uh, my uh, judicial robe. I have a. a it's striped and, and colored and, and beaded, um, done by a traditional Sac and Fox Pawnee uh, woman who's no longer with us. Um, that, that she did for my Supreme Court justice robe. I, I had that in, in plexiglass and framed on the wall as well. So Mike, would you wear that when you would sit in the courtroom? Was that part of the traditional garb? Yes, I would, I would wear that when we heard cases. A lot more exciting than our traditional black robes. <laughs> a, lot, a lot more colorful. Well, Mike, we so appreciate your time today, your, your passion for uh, not only the Osage Nation, but your work with the Indian tribes. And I, I'm, we're proud of you as an alum, and we're, we're excited that you were able to share this information with us. I know the, almost we had over 100 people at one point listening. So thanks to all of you who could join us. Um, our next webinar is scheduled for February 22nd. It'll be over the lunch hour. Our president, Dr. Danny Anderson, will be talking about the value of a liberal arts education in the 21st century. It's a topic he's very passionate about. Meanwhile, thank you so much for joining us. Please continue to watch our podcasts and webinars. You can visit our, um, our webpage and the Alumni Association and discover the link to that. Uh, much of what we've done over the last 15 sessions is archived, so you can participate and watch it even if you couldn't see it today. Thanks again, and uh, go Trinity Tigers.